Mr. Meldrum's Mania by John Metcalf. Elevators, which Mr. Meldrum, English, would call lifts, are properly considered unromantic and mundane. Yet the crowd gathered on the first floor, Meldrum, ground of the Forensic Arts Building at 6.30 on a July morning to stare at this particular elevator, seemed to imply a possible exception. It was neither accident nor hold-up. The elevator itself appeared normal, a semi-local stopping at every floor above the twelfth, and it supplied no clue of violence. Indeed, no one affirmed that there had been a scene of violence, or otherwise. Three or four hard-bitten newspaper men were now, although reduced to a pathetic state of impotent and dangerous anguish, adopting a transparent pose of sour grapes, protesting that the whole affair was hooey, nothing but a false alarm. Yet they continued angrily to hang about. The air of the hall held a bleak, mute suggestion of the unsavoury and sinister, as if, some hours ago, it had experienced a large-scale concussion due to the explosion of an unspeakably tremendous but entirely odourless and silent firework, and was still coldly retrospective, shocked and strained. Yes, something had occurred. The elevator had descended from the sixteenth floor around 11.45 last night, and on that journey something very curious had taken place. Within the elevator, rumour asserted blandly, had been, besides the operator, a man who had come out of Dr. Faso's office. Dr. Faso himself was not available, had vanished shortly afterwards, leaving no trace. And one other, rather intoxicated individual, wearing a brown fedora, who had entered at the twelfth. When the elevator reached the bottom, the operator was unstrung, presently raving. He had been packed off, rumour again, to the psychopathic ward at Bellevue, where he had subsequently expired. What had become of his two passengers remained a matter for excited argument. The crowd increased. Nervous proprietors of a cigar store and an exchange buffet, which opened out into the marble-paved main hall, had got wind of the commotion and turned up two hours before their usual time to peer on tiptoe at the new operator. Yes, a new operator had already been installed, a huge mulatto, grinning embarrassedly and reaping a week's wages in importunately proffered tips by constantly transporting people to the sixteenth floor. Those temporarily deprived of his society had to content themselves with gazing in a fixity which later news might prove to have been morbid at the great gilt-framed alphabetical directory, whereon, under the heading North, they could pick out the name of Dr. Faso and his room number, 1654. It was now seven o'clock. The little throng grew noisier. Curious accretions from the outer commerce of 6th Avenue and 23rd Street momently poured in. The hall was packed. Where were the police? Someone, a woman, fainted. Mr. Whalen's blue coats were strangely in abeyance. But, ah, talk of the angels. Hubbub declined, then waxed again in a resentful murmuring. All out! Get out of here! Curtly commanding voices cut across conflicting cries of vain expostulation. The police had come at last. Diehards attempting to engage them in obstructive argument were dealt with summarily. Within three minutes more the place was cleared. Outside, however, until the tide of early morning traffic gradually affected their disintegration, several excited knots of the ejected lingered for discussion. Some of them, clustered on the opposite sidewalk, gazed up at the forensic arts building reprehendingly. What had occurred in there they might not know. Even the newspaper men, whose noses, tuned to supernatural keenness for the scenting of unlikely mysteries from afar, had brought them hurrying to the scene an hour ago, even these sleuths had come up unaccountably against a stubborn series of blank walls. Murder will out, 
But here apparently was something worse, something which all authorities concerned were ominously bent on hushing up. There were such things as public morals and the public interest. Well, it was useless to attempt to speculate. Doubtless, the only persons really in the secret were the absconding Dr. Faso, who, as everybody knew, was that same Dr. Faso, who was tried for poisoning his sister, the elderly, and Seuss, with a homemade lipstick. The man in the fedora, who, as everybody knew, was that identical fedora-wearing man, who, though he lived out somewhere in the Bronx, bought all his underclothes at Stern's, and used to run a gambling joint upon East 53rd Street. And finally, the other passenger, that other guy, called Meldrum. Was that the Meldrum who, after having been a freak at Coney, had ended up by getting fabulously rich, buying a state at Montauk, and marrying the daughter of an English nobleman? Yes, naturally, it was the very same. Little by little, as their interest flagged or duties pressed, the chagrined groups of resolute mythologists broke up and scattered. By 7.15, latest, none of them remained. Meldrum, strangely enough, quite inexplicably, they had got that bit straight. That was his name. And, freak, they were actually getting warm. Meldrum, however, if he had been at hand to overhear, would certainly have laughed at their preposterous conjectures would have been tickled to observe how their exiguous fund of information had been ingeniously supplemented by invention. How very wide their guesses always were of the real, dreadful mark. Or, no, probably after all he would not have laughed. The nuclear components of Mr. Meldrum's humour had been long ago disastrously dissolved. It was exactly seven months and eighteen days since he had been amused at anything at all. On that occasion, so ferociously intact was his appreciation of the comic then, he had recalled, while sitting in a dentist's chair, one of the gorgeous inconsequences of Mr. Frank R. Sullivan, and chuckled. Novocaine had been injected. It was the grisly time of waiting for the pull, yet Mr. Meldrum chuckled, he had read Mr. Sullivan's extravaganza the previous evening, and now, for some reason, its unabashed and flagrant funniness was more than he could bear. The dentist was a little shocked, vaguely offended, too. One's victims did not usually laugh. One's manner became cold and threatening. Now, wider, please. Meldrum's unseasonable merriment was quenched. The tooth ground and crackled numbly in his jaw, and its extraction hurt a trifle more than he had bargained for. He went off, chastened. This was not in New York, but in Toronto. Mr. Meldrum, not generally sentimental, had been visiting a town in Ontario, where he had spent four years as a boy. Indeed, he had passed several days in his old home, which still belonged to him. Before his new tenants arrived, he had rooted pleasantly about in a loft, where books, toys, pictures, other souvenirs of childhood had been stored. From Toronto, he went to Montreal and Halifax, then sailed for England. The tooth, or rather its now vacant site, still gave him trouble. It did not hurt particularly, yet the disagreeable sensation of numbness persisted. Also, this being the first time he had ever had an adult tooth extracted, the fact that his full complement of thirty-two had been at last reduced to thirty-one rankled absurdly in his mind as quite a serious grievance. Aboard the Empress of Scotland, he had a birthday, coincidentally enough his thirty-second, and consumed a vast quantity of John Collins, but the liquor only made him more depressed. He would never see thirty-two again and he would never boast thirty-two natural teeth again. All the way over he slept badly, and when the vessel docked at Liverpool he was feeling actually seedy. At Euston his friend Ronald Spillman met him. London was obscured by a November fog, and till they reached the flat in St John's Wood, Spillman remained unable to see Mr Meldrum's face distinctly. Then, however, as the electric lights flashed on, Spillman exclaimed, Why, 
You look quite knocked up. Had a bad passage, I suppose. Really, you look quite ill. No, said Mr. Meldrum, querulously. I'm not ill at all. We did have rather a rough crossing, but it's not that. I think it's this damn tooth that I had pulled when I was staying in Toronto. It still feels sort of swollen. For another month, this was all that happened. Mr. Meldrum, whose given name was Amos, continued peevish, and notwithstanding several contemptuous London dentists, was still inclined to blame the absent tooth. However, his jaw did gradually get better, and he was forced to cast about for other explanations. Was it his business that was bothering him again? Mr. Meldrum, ungrateful for prosperity, had always felt demeaned and fettered by his business, and when he thought in contrast of persons like John Maceville, Hegel, Helio Gabalus, and Edison, and the substantial contributions they had made to human progress, his sense of stark inferiority became acute. His own trade seemed altogether too much of a racket, consisting in supplying the entire downtown region of Manhattan with rare Spanish delicacies. For some years he had owned a couple of stores near 14th Street and 8th Avenue and two others by the Battery, and it was with an eye to the replenishing of these emporia, with Ibanez, Olives, Espadrillas, and Pio Borroja, that he now found himself on European soil. Presently he must journey on to Spain. Yet it was not his scruples in respect of good old Pio that were worrying him now. He was the prey of a peculiar depression which remained obstinately entrenched within his brain. Mr. Spillman, to cheer him, brought a number of his boon companions to the flat, without avail. Ronald's acquaintance could roughly be divided into two partially overlapping sections, the candidates for Bright's disease and the aspirants to cirrhosis. But not even from the impressive individuals who belonged to both could Mr. Meldrum now derive a shred of consolation. Once, toward the end of a rather hectic evening, they had pretended that he was a corpse, and had fanned at him with hands and handkerchiefs. Mr. Meldrum, resuscitated, had bounded angrily from his chair. "'Don't do that!' he cried. "'It hurts! It's not funny!' Arnold gazed at him, amazed. "'Hurts? Why, we didn't come inside a foot of your old face!' Mr. Meldrum grunted. They were drunk, and it was no use arguing. But they had hurt his face. He had felt their fingers and their handkerchiefs distinctly. Next day, about a week before he had to go to Spain, he had, out of pure spite, spent an hour in the British Museum, staring morosely at the mummies. A dark cloud of foreboding was overshadowing him. The skin, round and above his nose, was creepy and a little itchy. Absently, and without any real interest, he approached his face toward the glass front of a case in order to make out the hieroglyphs upon a cartouche more exactly. Suddenly he had a shock. He couldn't get nearer to the glass. His face was still a foot or more away from it, yet he felt something, felt the glass. His heart bounded sickly. Yes, he was able to get a bit nearer now, about six inches, but only by defying a sensation of increasing pressure, not pain, merely resistance and a sort of weird discomfort. He tried again. Ah, it was better. Trembling, he continued to experiment. Not till a footfall sounded close to him did he desist. One of the museum attendants was regarding him very curiously. Mr. Meldrum turned and left the building. But on returning to the flat, he remained nervous and indeed dismayed. If that sensation came again, he must certainly see a doctor. Hi, Roland called. What the hell? What do you think you're doing? Oh, n nothing, said Mr. Meldrum, seated in an armchair and forgetting Mr. Spillman's presence. He had been tentatively making passes with his fingers round his nose. 
The trip to Spain had failed to repair Mr. Meldrum's spirits or his temper. It was, in fact, upon the evening of his homecoming to St. John's Wood that he at last felt driven to confide in the shocked Mr. Spillman. From this point, his first definite avowal of the symptoms that distressed him were to date both the growing apprehension and concern of all his friends and the progressive, steadily accelerating march of his own mania. That it was mania, Mr. Spillman never doubted. His crony, upon arrival, had collapsed on a divan. Ronald, bringing whisky, had noticed a queer, hatchy expression about his eyes. Well, Amos, I'm dashed sorry you're no better. Was business bad or what? Oh, business. Business was as good as usual. Madrid was not too bad, and Barcelona, and down south, the fly. You know, even at Christmas it wasn't cold enough down there to kill them. Ah, oh, said Ronald, uncomfortably. Yes, how annoying. They kept you awake at night. Yes, they did. But I didn't mind that till it got light and I could... Ronald, he broke off, I must tell you, I could feel them on my face when I could see that they weren't there. Oh, come now. Really? Mr. Spillman essayed a smile, but his hand refilling Mr. Meldrum's glass was trembling. Amos's face gave one the creeps. It looked shriveled, empty like a baby's, and at the same time haunted. Ronald, though inwardly repelled, put a hand on his shoulder. Of course it's simply nerves. Still, go on. Get it off your chest. Mr. Meldrum did. Horror-stricken, he had lain in bed and watched the flies, walking, as it were, on nothing. Felt them as well as their perambulations had defined in space, a contour which did not exist. And in brushing them away at last he had also felt, though less precisely, his own fingers. How far away were those flies? Mr. Spillman fearfully inquired. About six inches, usually. It depended. Straight in front of my nose and forehead, they were always farther out. It's the same when I try with my fingers. But I haven't got the feeling now. Not since I left Spain. For a long time they sat talking and drinking. Mr. Spillman, though affecting to think lightly of the matter, was perturbed. People with delusions always made his flesh crawl. Upon retiring, he was careful to lock his bedroom door. Mr. Meldrum, on the other hand, was relieved at having unloaded his anxieties on his friend. He enjoyed, for a wonder, a fairly good night's rest, and it was only when he got out of bed next morning that his alarm returned. He was about to go into the bathroom for his customary ablutions, when his glance chanced to halt upon the pillow, which until very recently had been beneath his head. The impress still remained obscurely, but, was it merely his imagination, seemed unusual. He had been lying on his right side, and now toward the left of the pillow, as one looked at it in a place corresponding with the then position of his nose, was a long, hook-shaped groove. He emitted a low, moaning cry. <laughs> Mr. Spillman came running. What is it? What's the matter? Ah, oh. Mr. Meldrum faltered. This time he had better keep his own counsel. Oh, it's... it's nothing. But his face was ashy, and his teeth chattering. From the nerve specialist he came away a few days later, discouraged and resentful. True that he had stopped short of telling the neurologist quite all his symptoms. For the same reason which restrained him from mentioning the pillow incident to Ronald, he had suppressed the most bizarre. Puzzled, the nerve specialist had spoken of hyperesthesia, and neuroses, and then, after a pause, proceeded to make ominously casual inquiries concerning Mr. Meldrum's family tree and the friends or relatives with whom he might be staying at the moment. Mr. Meldrum, shutting up like an oyster, had gone off in something near to panic. As it happened, however, he was this very evening destined to meet Bertram Spode, and in him to discover unexpectedly a friend in need 
Mr. Spode was an acquaintance of Ronald's, an eccentric young man who studied geology at the Imperial College of Science, and was pretty safely on the cirrhosis list but for whom Mr. Meldrum nonetheless had always entertained a sneaking tolerance. He was, at any rate, quite easily the least insufferable of Ronald's gang, when, after the others had uproariously departed with their host to make a night of it, Bertie continued hiccuping on the divan. Amos felt almost glad of his society. Up to this point, the evening had for Mr. Meldrum not been gay. He had not mentioned his consultation with the neurologist, but sensed a strange constraint in Ronald's manner. Once, with sinister irrelevance, Mr. Spillman had asked him suddenly about his maiden aunt, Amos's sole surviving relative, and upon being told that the good lady lived in France, tactlessly grew more evidently anxious than before. To Mr. Meldrum's other trials now was added the necessity of seeming more than ordinarily sane, a feat which, when attempted too deliberately, is very difficult. But now Bertie Spode and Amos were alone, and for a while the hiccups from the divan were the only sounds that broke the silence. Abruptly Mr. Spode sat up and spoke. Ronald thinks you've gone batty, and I can see you're pretending not to be. I'm interested. I wish you'd Tell me all about it. Mr. Meldrum wondered whether he ought to feel offended, and on deliberation decided in the negative. After Ronald and the nerve specialist, he badly needed a sympathetic listener. It's my face, he prefaced awkwardly. I know it sounds preposterous, but, well, I can feel things in the air, in front of it. He narrated his experiences in the British Museum and with the flies in Spain. Mr. Spode, intrigued, no longer hiccuped. He plied Mr. Meldrum eagerly with questions. Can you feel it now, like that? Mr. Meldrum considered. Yes, in a way. I mean, it's not necessary now for anything to touch it. I... You mean, said Bertie, interrupting, that you can feel a sort of boundary line in space, a kind of extra surface where the you ends and the not you begins, rather like those chappies who've had their legs amputated and still have pains in their toes, eh? Yes, agreed Mr. Meldrum, whom this analogy had struck as apt. It is like that, I suppose. In the excitement of discussing his peculiar symptoms, he almost forgot, momentarily, to feel afraid. Of course, Mr. Spode continued, it's probably the brain. I'm not being rude, but I was doing medicine before I went in for geology. The brain is a rare and curious organ. For instance, pressure on the unsinate gyrus results in the characteristic unsinate group of fit accompanied by olfactory sensations, odours, which have nothing to account for them outside. Get me? You smell things when there's nothing there to smell. Oh, said Mr. Meldrum. He somewhat disapproved of this last parallel. His gyrus, he was sure, was quite all right, and certainly he had no fits. Or again, Mr. Spode proceeded, warming. It may be a psychoanalyst's job entirely. Pity you aren't in Vienna, or still in the USA. Alienists are more in vogue out there. If I were you, I shouldn't bleat too much. People are sure to think that you've gone bugs. Look at old Ronald. He was telling all of us just now that if you went on having queer ideas, he'd have to find your relative's address and get you put away. He— What? exclaimed Mr. Meldrum. He said that? Yes, replied Mr. Spode composedly. He did. He was very pessimistic, talking about commissioners in lunacy, and Mr. Meldrum had sprung to his feet. I won't stay here another hour, not an instant. If he... Bertie, too, had risen. Well, I, I don't blame you. Look here. I've got a brainwave. Come along with me. Just bring a 
toothbrush and pyjamas. Then in the morning you can fetch your other things. Old Ronald wouldn't mind. In fact, come on. But his entreaties were indeed unnecessary. Mr. Meldrum was fairly boiling with indignation. He was so angry that all his terror had departed. It was only when, carrying a small suitcase, he was about to follow Bertie from the flat that any qualms returned. And then, Mr. Spode was saying, tomorrow I should like to make a little, well, experiment. It struck me that it might be kind of interesting to find what shape your face was now, your other face. What, what shape? Mr. Meldrum was staggered. Oh, it's all right. I'll explain what I mean tomorrow. Come along. Dubiously, Mr. Meldrum came. By way of anaesthetic, this was next morning at about eleven, Mr. Meldrum, his neck imprisoned in a vice, found himself confronted by a large geological map of the British Isles hung on the opposite wall. Think, Bertie had instructed, of the clan Delo flags or the Ordovician system and trilobites, anything. Brood on em while I'm getting ready, and whatever you do, don't jerk your dear old bean about once I begin. Built around Mr. Meldrum's head was a sort of cardboard scaffolding, like an unfinished box, through two opposite sides of which, when preparations were complete, Bertie proposed to insert numerous bonnet pins. The pins were to be pushed through slowly, perpendicularly, and knob first, and as soon as each knob touched his supernumerary face, Mr. Meldrum was to exclaim, Now! Mr. Spode, at that instant, would stop pushing, and leaving that pin in position would pass on to the next. In this way, as he delightedly explained, the pin knobs would ultimately form a variety of three-dimensional graph, from which the shape of Mr. Meldrum's phantom countenance could profitably be deduced. Just, Bertie went on fanatically to point out, as if you were a crystal, what? and I were plotting its indicatrix. Only then it would come out sort of egg-shaped, and I don't expect yours will. Mr. Spode proceeded to talk of birefringence, of ordinates, and of something to do with light waves called moo-moo, in a manner that made Mr. Meldrum's brain reel. Mr. Meldrum now regretted his position. He felt very undignified. Besides that, began to fear that Mr. Spode was not, not absolutely normal. No one to start with who was thoroughly, unquestionably sane would have been in possession of so many bonnet pins. Ready, said Bertie. Now for Lord's sake, still, don't twitch an eyelid. The experiment proceeded without a hitch. Mr. Meldrum at intervals exclaiming, Now! or ouch, and Bertie thereupon desisting instantly from pushing in the pin. Finally Mr. Spode unclamped the vice and set his prisoner free. Now we can have a squint, but make it snappy, I've got a lecture on at twelve. Bertie had taken an oblong of what seemed to be damp blotting paper or papier-mâché, patting and pressing it delicately against the heads of the bonnet pins so that the pliant material, following their varying distances from the cardboard wall, formed a sufficiently close average approximation to the ideal surface, which the pins had point by point delimited. Having repeated this operation with the other wall, Mr. Spode brought the two together, peered into the resulting mould, and burst into hysterical laughter. Oh! 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 Good Lord! It's... it's a snout! Or else a, a bill? The human tapir! What? If you... Hello? Mr. Meldrum, too, had looked into the mould, turned pale. Bertie deposited him upon a sofa, brought him whisky. Well, I suppose I oughtn't to have laughed. A bit of a shock, no doubt, but really... Just fancy you among the old proboscidea. <laughs> Good Lord. Despite perfunctory contrition, Mr. Spode's callous merriment continued. Finally, however, after a startled glance at the clock, he struggled into his coat and swept up a large pile of notebooks. I've got to scoot. Leave those two moulds to dry. 
We'll use them as a matrix later on. So long. Mr. Meldrum lay inert. Bertie had been gone twenty minutes when at length he rose unsteadily from the sofa. Shivering, he took a long pull at the whisky, staggered into the bedroom, packed his suitcase. Then, returning to the front room, he placed the two moulds on the floor and passionately trod upon them. It was twelve-twenty-five. He still had the key of Ronald's flat. Ronald, at this hour, would not be home. Emerging onto the Cromwell Road, Mr. Meldrum took a taxi to the Spillman flat, deserted save for a negligible maid, and hastily collected his belongings. In another taxi he drove to Cowcross Street, and there handed over all his luggage to the storage department of Messrs. Cook. This done, he wandered vaguely down by Ludgate Hill, along the Strand. Dazed and light-headed, he strolled for half an hour or more indecisively northwards and westwards, and then halted. An imposing grey pediment, supported on fat, cylindrical grey columns, confronted him. Euston? No, there were pigeons. It was the British Museum again. Trembling, and after several seconds' hesitation, he turned in. Once more he was looking at the mummies. Not at the mummies, merely. He gazed unseeingly at scarabs, papyri, colossal heads, representations yet more terrifying of grotesque, semi-human deities. Horus, Anubis, Set. Perhaps the whisky had made him slightly drunk, keeping his horror at his own condition in abeyance. He was not thinking specifically about the result of Mr. Spode's experiment. Even after an hour he began to feel a little hungry. Only when he was about to leave the building for a meal did anything extraordinary occur. He was turning away from a large case of pottery when someone jostled him. Mr. Meldrum, nerves on edge, swung round wrathfully. An ill-favoured individual, smelling of garlic, returned his angry stare. Now then, clumsy! Suddenly Mr. Meldrum's pent emotions were canalised and liberated in the form of rage. He was seething with indignation. Clumsy yourself? What do you mean by... The garlicky gentleman's features, too, were distorted with passion. Look here, you shy it, see? Cos if you don't, I'll push your face in, see? I'll push your silly face in. What would happen next, Mr. Meldrum could never recollect distinctly. I'll push your face in, see? At these words, something snapped in his brain. His face. There was something appallingly wrong with his face. Everyone could see it. He was mad. He heard himself shouting, I'm mad! I'm mad! Then his voice changed. His own voice. With his own ears he could hear it change, dropping in an instant from a delirious scream to a low, senseless chirp, like a bird's, kind of twittering. He saw the man in front of him fall back, regarding him in horror. Yes, he was mad. He could feel his jaw working, chattering rapidly up and down making those curious sounds, knew that his eyes were brailing. Tendons were running up, surrounding him. His arms were pinioned. The room swam. He must have fainted. How had he escaped? He remembered nothing. This was the Strand, and he was walking eastwards past the law courts. His head ached, and his clothes were soiled his collar torn. Up to a point his memory held good, then stopped. He had had a seizure in the museum, shouted out that he was mad, but he was not mad now. Not in that way. By degrees, however, something of his terror returned. How had he got away? It was four o'clock and growing dark. There must, he imagined, be some sort of search for him, some sort of hue and cry. He struck northwards, up an alley, avoiding lights. In a square, a newsboy was running. Evening Standard! Mr. Meldrum, signalling, bought a copy. For some seconds he saw nothing, 
but presently his glance snapped down, appalled upon a headline. Extraordinary scene in British Museum. Madman escapes. He read on in bewilderment. This was all wrong. Ridiculous. No, he could not believe it. That was not his name. His name was Meldrum. Meldrum. The paper dropped. He leaned against a railing. Meldrum. Oh, it was clever of him to have given the wrong name, though he had no recollection of having done so. Now it might be easier to evade inquiries and detection, but the name he apparently had given was so peculiar he couldn't make it out. The entire history was incredible. If he were mad, the museum authorities were at least equally insane. He must get off, give all of them the slip. Ronald and Bertie, everyone who knew, he must go back at once, back to the States if he could manage it, on the next boat that sailed. Retrieving the paper, he glanced round him cautiously. No one was following him. He had been marvellously lucky. He would get something to eat and drink, then think how he might best shake off pursuit. That story in the standard was all bunkum. Also, his face was better. It felt almost normal. If he could but return in safety to America, he could convince himself that this was nothing but a frightful dream. On the boat going over, however, an obstinate suspicion clung to him that there was more in it than that. For one thing, his torn collar and soiled clothes proved definitely that he had been involved in some quite overt and undignified affray. And for another, the peculiar sensations round his nose returned. It is necessary to explain that Mr. Meldrum had thought it wiser, instead of sailing direct from England, to lose himself for a month upon the continent, not even risking the removal of his luggage from the warehouse. Drawing funds through Morgan's in the Place Vendôme at Paris, he had gone on to Switzerland and Italy, leaving for New York in a Fabry line boat from Naples late in February. Now, with his morale somewhat seriously decayed, he spent most of his time in brooding on that mystifying item in the Evening Standard. This account, from which it may be here as well to quote, had run in part as follows. The stately peace of the British Museum was shattered early this afternoon by an unusual incident. A man who had been standing before a case of pottery of the period of the Shepherd Kings and whose actions for some time had seemed suspicious, became suddenly involved in a violent fracas with another man stationed close behind him. Seized and taken for examination to the assistant curator's room, he protested that this was the thirty-second occasion on which his opponent, James Buggins, had insulted him, that he was a manufacturer of bonnet pins, and that his own name was Thoat, or Thoash. What is peculiar about the episode is that the policeman and two attendants in whose custody he was temporarily placed appear unable or unwilling to account for his escape. One of the attendants in particular was in such a condition of nervous collapse that he was subsequently removed to a hospital for treatment. It is thought, however, that Thoat may have been under the influence of liquor. The affair is being thoroughly investigated and a search made for him. Mr. Meldrum had refrained from looking at any English papers after leaving London. He now refused passionately to believe that he could ever have been able to think up nothing better than such a foolish and unlikely name as Thoat, or that he had said what he was reported to have said about the thirty-second insult and the bonnet pins. Still, he wanted to hear no more of it. He was probably very lucky indeed to have escaped, and even now did not feel absolutely safe. Ronald and the furiously imbecile B. Spode might long ago have squealed. Perhaps at this instant he was shadowed. Perhaps upon arrival at New York he would be summarily arrested. Happily, he was mistaken. It was, for March, a really glorious day, and he was met outside the customs shed by someone who had had advanced word of his coming and who, so far from promptly clapping him in irons, for the raging maniac he was, laid an affectionate hand of greeting on his shoulder. Why, hello, Amos. Why, you're looking swell. Mr. Meldrum's eyes filled gratefully 
He knew that he was looking like a fly-blown oleograph of last Saturday's leg of mutton, but it was tactful of his friend to say the contrary. Why, hello. Hello, Smith. The real name of the man who welcomed Mr. Meldrum was not Smith. Still, we proposed to call him that. Just Smith. He had not yet invested in the brown fedora. But of this person for the present, the less said, the better. Spring had arrived. There was a lamb or two in Central Park, and a conspicuous goat or two in Greenwich Village. Weary, steel-jawed executives were returning with last season's wives and niblicks from Florida, and setting out with fresh ones for Europe. The rent of penthouses had soared. Despising, however, the vernal excitements of Manhattan, Mr. Meldrum had been living morosely in Lenoniumville, S.I. in Jeanette, P.A., and in Emporia, Cam. Save for occasional weekend contacts with the person Smith, he had been leading the existence of a hermit. Under the circumstances, he cannot be blamed, although the curious extension of his face was usually no more than sentient, so to speak, and only sometimes vaguely tangible to his own fingertips. He could not but believe that it was visible as well, and that to everyone who passed him in the street. He rarely ventured out except at night, and through the day sat brooding in his room. Two letters sent to his business address had reached him from Ronald, but having apprehensively perused the first, he threw the second in the fire unopened. Mr. Spillman, making no reference to Bertie or to the British Museum, had implored his friend to see a good neurologist immediately. If Amos would but realise that his malady possessed no basis in objective fact, all, Ronald vigorously declared, would yet be well. With this opinion, Mr. Meldrum violently disagreed. To call his trouble psychological was just an insult. We are now, of course, approaching Dr. Faza and the elevator. Mr. Smith, to whom Amos had confided the whole terrible affair, had frequently advised a consultation with an alienist without success. Ronald's letter, he could see, had had a very bad effect and greatly stiffened Amos's resistance. Still, though discouraged, he was persevering. Upon a sunny Friday morning late in May, he donned for the first time the brown fedora, set out from the Grand Central Terminal aboard the 1015, and stubbornly returned to the attack. Amos, it was now Sunday and lunchtime at Emporia, was expecting him and was standing with the front door open on the veranda. The sun was dazzling in his eyes, and the expression on the face of the approaching Mr. Smith was indistinct. Mr. Meldrum, however, noticed that, when a few yards distant, his friend halted suddenly. Amos moved forward from the open door to meet him. Well, baby, how's... Why, what the hell? Mr. Smith, his gaze stony, was trembling, and it was some time before he recovered sufficiently to explain that he was subject to heart attacks. Even then, it was with obvious reluctance that he suffered Mr. Meldrum to lead him into the house and to pour him out a glass of fusel oil slightly impaired by alcohol. Heart attacks? You never spoke of them before. Mr. Meldrum was in turn alarmed. He by no means credited the heart attack. To break a painful silence, he inquired presently, I suppose you've come to have another go at me about this psychoanalyst of yours, this Dr. Faser. Well, I've been thinking it over again, and perhaps... Perhaps I might try him after all. It seems the only hope. Mr. Smith's hollow eyes held no consciousness of victory. He was shivering slightly, displaying a tendency to wretch. I... I don't know that it would do a scrap of good. These alienists... What? Mr. Meldrum gazed incredulously. Why, you've been trying all along to... No, it'd be no good. But I shall go. It's not a scrap of good. I tell you, I shall go. Mr. Smith rose. I, I am afraid I've got to hurry. I, I just looked in. In vain, the astonished Amos sought to detain him. Mr. Smith was moving forlornly to the door. I'll, I'll see you soon again. 
Sorry, I couldn't stop. S so long. But Ferdinand... It was no use. Mr. Ferdinand Smith was now well out of the house and walking rapidly toward the station. Just before turning a corner of the road, he was observed by Mr. Meldrum to break into a run. Not until seated in the train and safely on his way back to New York did Mr. Smith allow himself to think too concentratedly about what he had seen as, half an hour ago, he had ascended Mr. Meldrum's steps, glanced forward for an instant, passed his friend to the front door, but then, and in an awful rush, the thing came over him. He understood now too well how Mr. Meldrum's wonderful escape had been effected. He could guess shrewdly at the reason why that policeman and those two attendants let him go. They, he suspected, must have seen what he himself had seen so recently. What had he seen? With the sun behind him and casting Mr. Meldrum's silhouette upon the lower portion of the open door, he had observed, at first incredulously, a curious shadow. But he could not remain incredulous for long. Mr. Meldrum had moved his head slightly, and the shadow had moved too. It was the shadow of something with a strange, beakish prolongation, a little like a crane's head, only the bill had been considerably more curved and sharper. Dr. Faso, a bland gentleman of fifty, took at the first encounter an instant fancy to poor Mr. Meldrum. Observing a pipe in Mr. Meldrum's hand, he had rapped out, What mixture do you smoke? Ah, Dunhill's Royal Yard. Bit of a sybarite, eh? Already prepossessed in his new patient's favour, he had immediately resolved to multiply his fees by 1.5. Of this, our hero had suspected nothing. For a month he had been following Dr. Faso's instructions conscientiously, and now his features wore a peculiar expression, at once debauched, propitiatory, and coy, like those of a supremely difficult yet amorous bloodhound. Mr. Smith, after his inexplicable fault to Fass, had held himself aloof, but became less standoffish by degrees, and had eventually even formed the habit of accompanying Amos to the alienist's door frequently meeting him again when he came out. Today, a bright June afternoon, was scheduled to see Mr. Meldrum's nineteenth session. Well, so long, baby. I'll be back at quarter off. Good luck. Mr. Smith departed. Amos rang sharply twice, then entered. The psychoanalyst received him cordially. Dr. Faso had formed his own opinion concerning Mr. Meldrum which was that he was horribly insane. But he did not allow this melancholy conviction to betray itself. Moreover, he had just got hold of an idea, requiring Mr. Meldrum's goodwill, money, and cooperation. Before, however, proceeding to its discussion, he subjected his patient to the customary examination. Good, he remarked at last. Progress most satisfactory. Persevere with that tatting exercise, only think of it as drizzling, or glooning, not as tatting. It releases the nodal walls, and I suggest that the expression snout or pecker may do harm. Think of it as a nozzle instead of a muzzle or a pecker. Yes, said Mr. Meldrum, docilely. I will, and could I look at those wax moulds again? Certainly. Here they are. For Amos's greater reassurance, Dr. Faso had taken several impressions of his face in wax. The resulting simulacra Mr. Meldrum now surveyed with resignation, if not actual enthusiasm. You see, they're perfectly normal. Your notion of a muzz, a nozzle, is merely a too vivid projection and exaggeration of the, <clears throat> the normal nose awareness like a line divided externally in Euclid, don't you see? I see, said Mr. Meldrum, again docilely, though the comparison struck him as inept and puerile. 
Shall I talk now? By all means. For half an hour, Amos talked, while Dr. Farzo listened, taking notes. Mr. Meldrum was exhorted upon these occasions to let himself go, speaking without apparent rhyme or reason of anything that came into his head. And these requirements he amazingly fulfilled. Dr. Farzo had by this time such an acquaintance with the less creditable idiosyncrasies of Amos's subconscious ego as would have caused a weaker man to blench. But from long practice he was blasé and inured. Always, whilst Mr. Meldrum raved complacently of kites and cricket bats, or prattled evilly of pacifiers and ditties, Dr. Farzo would be eagerly poring over these inanities, dredging and delving in the fond expectation of discovering some childhood trauma, which might account, too high a plausibility was not essential, for this perverse delusion of a snout. Up to the present he had been disappointed. Amos's subconscious was indeed simply hag-ridden by complexes, but these were seldom of the proper kind. However, Dr. Faso persevered. If only, as he was tireless in explaining, if only he could light on the deep-buried origin of hidden conflict, expose its overwhelming triviality to the derisive upper story of his patient's mind, the thing would end. Once Amos could be brought to realise that his entire nozzle mania was the result of, say, his finding seven ears upon his rocking horse when he intelligently expected three, he was as good as cured. All the energy which his subconscious had been fatuously expending on this banal, if rather puzzling, incident since he was four years old would be released. His libido, now choked and damned and in a ghastly state of separation, would flow on tranquilly again. He would be well. At the conclusion of the present recital, Dr. Faso ran his eye with apparent satisfaction over his notes. To the lay mind, these jottings, representing all his worthwhile garnerings from Mr. Meldrum's mental detritus over a period of five weeks, might have suggested little, or have been misleading. They were a Nose. Nosey P. Nosey Parker. Central Park. Nozzle. Hosepipe episode at age six. B. Thirty-two. His age, last birthday. Had thirty-two teeth until quite recently. Plays piquet and bezique. Thirty-two cards in pack. Other instances in support on page thirteen. C. Egypt. Wrote article on scarabs for school magazine. Father was in Egyptian civil service. British Museum. D. Scribe. Is peculiarly sensitive to this and to related words. Dr. Faso snapped his notebook. He would now broach his big idea. Listen, he said. I want you to agree to something. Your talking is still too inhibited to be much use, and my material is insufficient and conflicting. I want you to let me go up to Canada and look over your toys. Toys? queried Mr. Meldrum weakly. Toys and other things, books and games, everything. It needn't really cost you more than, say, six hundred berries. Do you agree? Mr. Meldrum looked sheepish. Oh, I say, do you really mean that? Berries? Dollars. Dollars. Don't, don't be absurd. Six hundred dollars. Oh, dollars, said Mr. Meldrum. My nose feels so itchy. Yes, all right. Six hundred dollars. During Dr. Faso's absence... Mr. Meldrum, who had given him the keys to his again untenanted Ontario home, stayed at a little place up the Hudson, anxiously awaiting his return. Occasionally, however, he forgot to be anxious, and then he was just plainly mad. Harmlessly and happily, but still mad. Mr. Smith, realising this, was terribly depressed. Amos had a large framed photograph of Dr. Faso hung in his bedroom, and he would often stand in front of it, 
and bark. His landlady and her husband, too, thought it was all very sad, and had put up the rent and board money to quite a formidable figure. Nevertheless, this period was probably the most peaceful that poor Amos had enjoyed from the first onset of his mania. By fits and starts, he would begin worrying about his neglected business and about his nose, but in the main his condition was one of pleasurable lunacy. His nozzle now had ceased to trouble him, save in a mental sense. He knew its contours so exactly that he avoided automatically those painful contacts and collisions which had annoyed him previously. He no longer, for instance, banged it or stubbed it accidentally or burnt it in the soup. To all intents and purposes, it was just as if he had been born that way, with a snout or proboscis fifteen inches long, and as if this proboscis then had suddenly become invisible, really a matter for congratulation. Since the commencement of the alienist's ministrations, he had grown plainly madder, yet if he now were happier as a result, who could regret the fact? He had talked so incessantly to Dr. Faso of his childhood that a state akin to infantilism had, perhaps, mercifully supervened. He would call horses GGs, and his watch a tick-tick. Frequently Mr. Smith could hardly restrain him, when they were both retiring, from calling out to Mrs. Schultzenheimer, his landlady, with a request that she should tuck him in and give the two of them a good-night kiss. Mr. Smith's own feelings towards Amos now were mixed. Although he had managed to persuade himself that the frightening shadow on the door had been delusion, possibly telepathic, he was far from forgetting that perturbing incident, and his present attitude to Mr. Meldrum might be described as one of very gingerly affection. In spite of reason and of common sense, he could not always avoid looking at his poor friend's face with something of a horrible expectancy. But on the whole, these days passed placidly, and it was really surprising how intelligently Amos would often talk about the absent Dr. Faso. Thanks to the alienist's repeated explanations, he had grasped the root ideas of expressive psychotherapy with thoroughness, and he was never tired of expounding them, in turn, to Mr. Smith. It's something that happened when I was little. Ooh, ever so teeny, called a tauma. And the tauma make me nosly, Ferdy. Only I forget what it was. Good Dr. Faso's finding it in Canada. And when he come back, he tell Amos all about naughty tauma. And then Amos laugh and say, Ooh, silly. And then I give Dr. Faso six hundred bellies, and no more tauma, no more nozzle, nozzle all gone away. It was when, during lucid intervals like these, the mind of Amos would regain too briefly all its old familiar power and clarity, that Mr. Smith most keenly could appreciate the tragedy of its decay. Finally, after Dr. Faso had been gone three weeks, the crisis came. Amos and Ferdinand had been strolling after supper by the river, talking little. Exhausted by the heat, they turned in at their lodgings around nine o'clock. Amos, preceding his companion by a few yards, reappeared at the front door, waving a pale yellow slip of paper, as Mr. Smith was entering after him. The wire was from Montreal. They read it together. Good news. Great discovery. Arriving Grand Central. 8.30 p.m. Standard. Tomorrow. Congratulations, Faso. The whole chapter of accidents delayed the momentous interview next day. Owing to the derailment of another train near Troy, the Montreal Express had been held up. It was past ten when Dr. Faso arrived, and then Mr. Meldrum missed him at Grand Central. The alienist made it a strict rule to withhold his private address from all his patients and Mr. Smith and Amos spent an hour phoning desperately to his office. Finally they got him. Dr. Faso, realising their anxiety and himself ignorant of their present whereabouts, had merely dumped his luggage at his home and gone straight on to the forensic arts, waiting for them to ring him. Amos was to come to him there at once. The building was open all night for people known to the night watchman. A certain sedulously bibulous merchant, intimate with Dr. Faso, 
and whose work often necessitated his sitting up very late, had established on the twelfth floor a kind of ultra-private and select speakeasy, never closed. Mr. Smith, indeed, had made the acquaintance of a rather nice girl in there, and on previous occasions, while he had been escorting Mr. Meldrum to the psychoanalyst, he had often filled in an odd moment talking to her about his hometown in Ohio, which happened also to be hers. He proposed to do this now. First, however, he saw Amos to Dr. Farzo's door. Mr. Meldrum, though greatly excited and upon tiptoe with anticipation, had an obscure something in his manner which Mr. Smith could not pretend to like. Amos had snapped back for some reason from baby language into ordinary speech, and yet his friend was vaguely conscious that this change had not been for the better. Exactly how he realised this, or what precisely he was now afraid of in poor Amos, Mr. Smith could not say. But that he was afraid of him was certain, and very glad to have got rid of him, if only for a while, when, from inside his sanctum, Dr. Farzo called on him to enter. It was arranged that Mr. Smith should come back to the office within half an hour's time. As Amos walked into the dim outer fringe of lights thrown by a reading lamp upon a desk, Dr. Farzo experienced an instant faint uneasiness, a twinge as of alarm. It was so slight that he ignored it at the time, but it did strike him that perhaps his patient was not looking quite so well as when he saw him last. Clasping Mr. Meldrum's hand, he smiled, however, and motioned him urbanely to a chair. Well, I have good news. I think I have run what we were looking for to earth at last. A long chase? Well worth it. For us both. Mr. Meldrum had sat down. Tell me, he said. I... He stopped. His eyes were glittering. Dr. Farzo searching his face, again had an uncomfortable sensation. Something prompted him, instead of proceeding to an account of his discovery, to veer off, as with an idea of gaining time, upon a trivial topic. He laughed. <laughs> I was a fool to take that day train down from Montreal. Properly punished, too. Ninety-five minutes late, there was a pause. Through a window opening on the air shaft, the dull rumble from Sixth Avenue rose faintly. The night was hot. Dr. Farzo passed a handkerchief across his forehead, made a humorous gesture as of wringing it out, and emitted a wry. Whew! Mr. Meldrum's intent silence disconcerted him. But he could no longer put off telling him what he had found. He cleared his throat, shot out his cuffs, altered the position of the light a little, and began. I want to impress upon you again that the most obstinate, inveterate neuroses have frequently been traced to something so apparently irrelevant, even ridiculous, that the patient may, at first, experience a certain <clears throat> difficulty. Difficulty in accepting these unrealized traumas as a sufficient explanation of his state. Nevertheless, the trauma is the explanation. Once the thing has been disinterred from the subconscious, brought out into the open and, so to speak, projected, all trouble goes. I have told you all this before, but I want to be sure of your own sympathy, cooperation, Dr. Farzo passed two fingers round the inside of his neck band. It was really very hot, and he could not deny it. He felt anxious. He had, he considered, put in a very good job of work for Mr. Meldrum up in Canada, but he had some misgivings as to its success. Now came the test. Would the elaborate explanation seem too flimsy and preposterous? Dr. Farzo whilst loyal in the main to his professional ideals, permitted himself to a degree of cynicism. He was inclined, on nearing the experimentum crucis, to glimpse discouraging resemblances between psychoanalysis and certain allied, though less generally established, cults. However, he must pull himself together, make the plunge. Listen, he said, then cleared his throat once more, 
he could not understand his own increasing trepidation. Not only had he an unpleasant consciousness that he had somehow chosen his previous words poorly, and the idea even came to him dangerously, but he was actually at a loss how to proceed. Finally, with Mr. Meldrum's dancing eyes upon him, he spoke again. Listen, and tell me if you understand. Scribe of the gods! Had Mr. Meldrum moved? Had his face twitched? His expression in the dim lamplight was peculiar, like that of a somnambulist unwillingly aroused, blindly and pitifully clinging to his sleep. So far that might be good. Dr. Faso had seen that look before, thought himself momentarily on surer ground. He had touched something deep, something significant. Scribe of the gods, he repeated slowly. Does that mean anything to you? Yes, I can see it does. Amos shuddered slightly. His lips parted. Yes, it does. I... Think back. I want you to think back. You have always been sensitive to that word. Scribe. To scripture. To the name of the French playwright. Scrib. Even to scribin. You never knew why, but I shall tell you. Scribe of the gods, of the Egyptian gods, Egyptian. Who was the scribe of the Egyptian gods? The silent form confronting Dr. Faso did not stir. Think back, and I shall add another word, a name, the name you gave them as your own in the museum, because you were thirty-two years old. Not thought. They didn't get it right. Not quite, but nearly. It was. Foth. Foth. It was out at last. What would he see? But for some reason he did not wish to look too closely at the figure in the chair. Instead he took up a small parcel which had been lying on his desk. I have the proof beside me here. A book. A book you glanced at, more than glanced at, when you were a little boy. And on a certain page are pencil marks, thumb stains, and childish scribblings. Upon a certain page, the thirty-second. Again he stopped. What was he going to see? He was aware, and too acutely, of this moment's drama. Yet he refused to glance at Mr. Meldrum. Still seated, with his head averted, he busied himself with the untying of the parcel. It was now, as he was pushing back the crackling paper wrappings, that he imagined he could catch a curious noise behind him, a faint sound like a sigh. But even then he did not turn. He opened the book, proceeded. Here is the page. The figure, 32, is very large, and just below it is the illustration, Foth, Foth with moon disc and crescent ibis headed, the amanuensis of the gods. You thought that, when that number had been reached, when you were 32, you would... Yes! It was Mr. Meldrum who had spoken, loudly and electrically. At last the psychoanalyst wheeled round. Mr. Meldrum had risen from his chair, was staring at that beak-faced spectre in the book. Dr. Faso too got up. He was more than nervous now. His whole body was bathed in sweat. Something was going wrong. Something was very much amiss. He did not know what it was. Yes! Again Mr. Meldrum had spoken, more loudly than before. It was the last word Dr. Faso was to hear him utter. And what was he doing? He was going, going away, striding immensely toward the door. Dr. Faso wanted to scream. 
in the next room, which he knew to be untenanted, he thought he heard a rustle, then a bump. But, but, gathering his courage, the alienist had spurred himself to those twin syllables of vain remonstrance. The next instant he knew better, no longer wished to detain Mr. Meldrum. His blood congealed. His mouth grew square in a tense rictus of extravagant dismay. A waft of gold, and as it were, aloof, bland and remote horror filled the room. Mr. Meldrum had by this time reached the door and opened it. His passage to it across the office floor had taken only a few seconds, yet those short moments had been long enough for Dr. Faso to feel a chill grew of terror travel up his spine. Mr. Meldrum, whose back alone was now visible, was in no separable individual particular transformed, but from his whole appearance, from his gait, his carriage, had been given off the threat of a tremendous and an imminent alteration. In his departing presence there had been indicated not indeed the fact, but the incipience of some appalling change. It was most fortunate that Dr. Faso could not see his face. The door was closed. The sound of footsteps grew fainter down the corridor. Dr. Faso sank back into his chair. His eyes, wildly staring, did not so much as glance at the six hundred dollar cheque which had been left upon his desk. Instead, and quite unluckily for him, they fastened upon one of the wax moulds of Mr. Meldrum's face. It was as he stared, repelled at this wax mould, that Dr. Faso fainted. What followed has perhaps in part been guessed. In any case, a hint or two may indicate a scene best left to the imagination. Mr. Smith himself, who was the only person besides the operator to accompany Mr. Meldrum in the elevator, was afterwards unable to give any clear account of what he saw. Not that he gave accounts. There were abundant reasons why his lips should remain sealed. Even if he had not got rather tipsy talking to his little twelfth-floor cutie from Ohio, he might have hesitated to accept that sight within the lift as actual fact. As it was, he fancied mercifully at the time that he was merely seeing things, as naturally he was, though not alone in the strict technical intention of that phrase. To begin with, he was not then expecting to see Mr. Meldrum, and in a somewhat gruesome sense, it may be doubted that he ever did. A certain amount of coincidence presided over this short-lived encounter. Mr. Smith, by 11.30, had become very sozzled, and for no reason at all decided to go down to the Western Union and send someone, anyone, a telegram. A few seconds previous to this, Mr. Meldrum, if whatever it was that had left Dr. Farzo's office can still be narrowly described as Mr. Meldrum, had got into the elevator on the sixteenth floor. About three seconds later, Mr. Smith also entered boisterously at the twelfth. The thing which, for convenience, we call Mr. Meldrum, would not immediately have attracted his attention, if it had not continued wearing Mr. Meldrum's clothes. It had taken at most three seconds for the elevator to pass downwards from the sixteenth to the twelfth, and it took considerably less than a proportionate time to reach the first, say seven seconds as an outside estimate. Yet in these seven seconds Mr. Meldrum ceased to be, and something hideously different took his place. Briefly, as soon as Mr. Smith had got into the lift, his gaze, bent downwards, chanced to fasten on a pair of shoes. He seemed to recognise those shoes, did recognise with qualms the pants above. Still, there was something strange about them, too. The limbs, which they presumably encased, had, there was actually no other word, a curious quality of being neuter. Although invisible, their character somehow revealed itself. They were each as blankly, as shockingly neuter as an umbrella handle, or the turned leg of a sofa. At the same instant that Mr. Smith's glance travelling upwards fixed itself in a glassy stare of horror on a changing head, came from the operator an appalling shriek. Ah! Past the remaining floors, 
say six or seven. The lift shot swiftly on its downward way. None of the three stiffed. At the bottom, the cage bumped to a standstill. The grill rattled open, allowing Mr. Smith and the now idiot operator to spill themselves upon the marble floor. The third occupant of the elevator got out the last. Nobody much was about. Mr. Smith remained sitting on the floor. The operator had just begun to gibber. Neither of them, however, took his eyes off the back of a retreating figure, moving slowly toward the door onto Sixth Avenue. Mr. Smith, watching it go, felt no remorse, save for his recent ill-advised potations. This kind of thing might be exciting, but it did not pay. Brought back instead old nightmares, old hallucinations, which he had hoped were long ago dismissed as mere delusions. Yes, that was it. What he had seen a moment or two previously was a bad dream made real, or so it seemed. It was that fearful shadow on the doorway in Emporia, come to life. To this point, unmolested, unremarked, a beak-faced monster wearing Mr. Meldrum's clothes stalked out into the night. To make a long story somewhat longer, it is still necessary to tidy up a few loose ends. Dr. Faso, left fainting in his chair, came to after a minute, regarded the life mask of Mr. Meldrum in imbecile relief. No, there was nothing wrong. The extraordinarily sympathetic phenomenon which he believed himself to have witnessed, consisting in the gradual emergence from the mould of a peculiar beak-like process over a foot long, had been imagination. A grotesque mistake. Yes, it was a mistake all right, but Dr. Faso wasn't taking any chances. Pausing only to snatch up the check, he bolted. The elevator not working, he had to run down fifteen flights of stairs. In the main hall he came upon the beginnings of a commotion, and the fag end of Mr. Smith still squatting on the floor. Mr. Smith, however, presumed a casual drunk, was not receiving much attention. The gibbering operator held the centre of the stage. Only a short time had elapsed since the elevator had descended, and the Ohio flapper, as well as a man who had noticed someone get into the cage at the 16th, and had subsequently seen Dr. Faso start off running downstairs, had yet to offer testimony. Dr. Faso assisted Mr. Smith to his feet. Quick! Let's get out of this. Get out, they did, and only just in time. With one regrettable exception, they have not, in prior persona, been seen or heard of since. And what of Mr. Meldrum? What of that foth incarnate, that grisly, hidden fear too aptly disinterred, personified, and stalking, as has been narrated, through the night? The change of which the onset was foreshadowed dimly in the alienist's office would seem to have been finally accomplished in the lift itself between the twelfth floor and the first. And after that the stalking did not last for very long, apparently. At the corner of 7th Avenue and 26th Street, just a few blocks away, a building had come down. Another was beginning to shoot upwards in its place. Into the twelve-foot chasm of an excavation, something fell fell down and broke its neck. An hour later the corpse was discovered and collected trepidantly. The medical inspector was available and summoned, losing his sleep for several nights in consequence. He was a good elk, a Rotarian, a KFC and a Kuwani, and his responsibilities weighed heavily. Finally, with soul-searching, he decided that the matter should be, if possible, hushed up. Those very odd-looking remains, after a deal of discussion in camera, recorded Christian burial. Nobody knew of it except a haunted view. It is perhaps surprising that this should be so, that this extraordinary history did not get about, only by chance indeed and after several weeks arriving at the ears of Dr. Faza, who is 
testimony to something. I am not quite sure what. Possibly to the hurrying, hard-headed and neglectful temper of New York. In London, such a story would have had the time to seed itself and propagate, have thriven better. As regards Mr. Smith, he never knew quite what to think about it all. Though he had lost a long-loved friend in Mr. Meldrum, it appeared foolish to repine. The thing that had walked out of the Forensic Arts Building was not truly Mr. Meldrum. It seemed by the time its transmutation was completed to have been just a sinister emptiness, something without sensations, motives, or affections. When it fell down and broke its neck, it had ceased to have a mind, in any sense that mind has ordinarily conveyed to human beings. From that point, Mr. Smith could hardly have desired the course of fate reversed. How to explain it? He does not try. Omnia exeunt in mysterium, as his former landlady, Mrs. Scholzenheimer, playfully reminded him one day last fall, when he encountered her quite accidentally at Long Beach, and to his chagrin was immediately recognised. Yet how could she have known? This unexpected meeting was, of course, the regrettable exception alluded to above, and brooding upon Mrs. Scholzenheimer has made Mr. Smith extremely nervous. Although the complete story never became public, and that small early July morning hubbub around the elevator was soon entirely forgotten, he still has an exaggerated fear of waking echoes. In spite of this, again, he feels a little like the ancient mariner, or like the seedy, weedy fellow of the Nancy Bell. He must tell somebody. At Dr. Farzo's instigation, and to avoid repressions, he has himself been psychoed, and has written an account of the whole painful history, but it is most essential that he remain incognito. It would, I feel, be quite intolerable otherwise. My name, as I have pointed out before, was at the very worst not really Smith, nor is it any name which may be printed over, under, or around this narrative. Nevertheless, I have a morbid dread of some things leaking out, and I have now elaborated and perfected my disguise. From the date of Mr. Meldrum's unfortunate apotheosis, I have never worn the higher flappers, or been on nodding terms with brown fedora. Today's story was Mr. Meldrum's Mania by John Metcalf. It was read by Jasper Lestrange. Well, I do hope you enjoyed it, and until next time, sweet dreams. <laughs>